The metaverse is emerging as the next big technology platform and promises to be the next frontier for human experiences on the internet. Into the Metaverse covers companies, technologies, and trends that are bringing these promises to life. Join creator and host Jonathan Ross Friedman, founder and CEO of SuperSocial, as he interviews the brilliant minds that are building, shaping, and investing in the Metaverse. Welcome to episode 25 of Into the Metaverse, where we help make sense of the Metaverse through deep interviews with the brilliant minds who build, create for, and invest in the Metaverse. Royal O'Brien is the general manager of digital media and games at the Linux Foundation. He served as a U.S. Marine and is a business and engineering veteran with more than 30 years of experience in the corporate enterprise and video game industries. He has founded and exited multiple companies. Much of his time is spent working with partners in the community to create business and open source practices for the open 3D initiatives in the Linux Foundation. Royal previously served at Amazon as the Game Tech Chief Evangelist, love the title, working directly with senior leaders at Amazon Web Services to create the overall vision and strategy to define the O3DE open source project, plan, license, timeline, and features in the preview and the final release. And before Amazon, Royal served as CEO and CTO of multiple organizations responsible for corporate development, VC funding, and enterprise negotiation focused on strategic marketing initiatives. For those who are not that familiar, the Linux Foundation is the organization of choice for the world's top developers and companies to build ecosystems that accelerate open technology development and commercial adoption. Founded in 2000, the Linux Foundation today provides tools, training, and events to scale any open source project, which together yep. deliver an economic impact not achievable by any one company. More information, can be found at linuxfoundation.org. Royal, with that introduction out of the way, super <laughs> delighted to welcome you on Into the Metaverse. Thank you, I really appreciate it. This is gonna be a lot of fun. It's funny you took note of my title at when I was at Amazon with the evangelist because I got called once for jury duty and uh, you would love it that they said, you know, you have to say your name and what your title what you do. And I told him and the judge literally stopped the entire courtroom. He says, you wanna explain to me, and mind you, this is in the South, this is in Florida. <laughs> he says, you want to explain to me how a guy named Royal has a job that's an evangelist to the court here, because I got to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually great. So, you know, it's been interesting, needless to say. <laughs> Royal and evangelist. That is true. That is true. All righty. So just before we dig in, as always, everything discussed on the podcast is not a financial advice, it's strictly educational. So, Royal, as we continue to build an evolving consensus around what the metaverse is, the first question I like to ask every guest that comes on the show, what is the metaverse for you? What is the metaverse, in your case, for the Linux Foundation? And what it is not, which is not less important than asking yeah. what it is? That's a really big question. What is the metaverse? The metaverse, to me, the way I explain it to people, is a series of different experiences that are interconnected, that allow you to traverse from experience to experience without breaking immersion. That's the key. So when we talk about what's the equivalent, well, when you get on the web today, okay, you open up your browser and you go to a web page. Well, do you actually close your browser down to open up a new web page? You don't. You actually click on a link or you open a new tab, you surf it. You're continuously moving from page to page, experience to experience, in an immersive type of environment, even though it's inside of a square box in 2D. And the metaverse is very much the same. Now, there are so many pieces to it to get this done that's ridiculous. And so when you hear things about the metaverse, people are talking about one aspect of it or things that they think of what it is. But there's so many elements to this of what needs to happen. And the funny thing is people think we have to reinvent the world to get this done, but we don't. And that's where open source comes into play because a lot of the systems we use every day, we use all the services on AWS and Google and Microsoft. A lot of these cloud services, where do you think they came from? Kubernetes, Docker, a lot of these are all open source projects that are maintained by these. And so open source is really everywhere. We use OpenSSL, notice the word open. Uh, so open source in the metaverse is actually a really big thing because for one, it helps us give an open implementation. It helps us work with the open standards it allows incumbents to be able to be at the same level as major companies. And it's really important because if you don't have, that means that you have a limited 
metaverse that's controlled, and it basically becomes a platform for the big people that are out there. You want incumbents to be on the same level playing field, like we have a web server, you build whatever web page, and you can become something, okay? That keeps companies on their toes. They have to reinvent themselves because the incumbents coming up will come up, and we need that to happen. So open source and open standards are a critical element for metaverse for how this will be done so that it levels the playing field. The web server that you use today that you're used to, that you know Apache or whichever one you like, that's going to have to be another module of what exists. The difference is that when we look at it, what the web server of the metaverse is tomorrow, it's a little more like a game server is what it is because it's not tracking web hits, it's tracking coordinate space and actions and relevant information coming in and going out. So that is really what the metaverse is to me and everything that surrounds it, which means commerce, intellectual property, identification, authentication, ledgering, control, transactions, what you can't see, how you're actually controlling that, how you're filling it. You have AI. I mean, nobody wants to get into a metaverse where there's nothing there. So you're going to need something to fill that space in the interim. You're going to need to be able to handle scaling. It's going to change how we use cloud and network and edge, what they need to look like because of the sheer volume of data. We can go on and on, but it's not just me sitting in a VR. It's when I have my phone with AR, it's when I'm looking at a 2D space. It's kind of a cross-platform, cross-experience, and there'll be ways and experiences and ways that we have that will work with it that are going to have to be just as immersive. With, with that initial point of view laid out as foundation for the conversation, I'd love to really kick off further by digging deeper into the core work that you guys are doing, including what is the core mission of the work you do at the Linux Foundation and how do you envision that serving in enabling or helping to realize an open metaverse? So one of the big pieces here is really working with the different open source communities and companies. You'll find out that a lot of times in open source, this is open source made for open source to be driven by open source and companies are on the outskirts. That's not realistic, okay? And if you think about it, companies actually use open source to help maintain things that they really shouldn't need to be maintaining, okay? The work that I'm doing here is focused on how do we bring this out to get as many minds on it, to basically slice it and beat it up as much as possible so that we all have as many angles covered. We're never going to get it right on the first iteration. It's going to take several iterations for us to get it right. But the more minds, the more arguments, the more food fights that we get going on, and this includes corporate partners, because the metaverse isn't just a play for fun and games. It's a place where meetings can be held. It's a place where education can be done. There's so many things to be done there. So if you take a look at how that works along with it, having that neutral space, that's the one thing the Linux Foundation is really, really good, is that we are a neutral space. We don't fly anyone's flag, okay? We're there to actually help companies who otherwise wouldn't or couldn't work together find ways to work together and also bring in independent smaller companies and incumbents and communities and people who just love the space, bringing them all together. And that's how you harness some serious brain power to get something done. It's not held by one organization that just says, we're going to lead the charge. We've seen that before. You had MySpace, and here comes Facebook, and you have YouTube. Well, they've got it. Nope, there's TikTok. And we see this happen all the time. So the idea here is instead of starting from like companies trying to drive it, it's having open source driving with companies contributing and working alongside with it. And that's why it's really important. And my perspective isn't about... And mind you, I have an engineer background. I write in assembly, I write kernel drivers, I write C++, I can write in web. It's all kinds of languages. So I look at the reality behind it also of what it takes to get it done from an engineer's perspective. And then I look at it from the business perspective as to why would a company want to do that? How, does it, how are the ramifications going to come into impact? And we talk about their marketing prowess and what they have to build. So having that approach to bring people together to actually achieve this goal and having it isolated into disciplines. In other words, if I'm really good at 3D and I'm really good at VR, how good am I at FinTech? Probably not, okay? So by having the people that can live in different special interest areas that have verticals that they're amazing at, allow them to democratize how decisions are made and bring them together with a committee or a board that can otherwise help bring all of this together by the disciplines and then combine it so that we can drive a better metaverse out in the open. Because if you think about it, a lot of events, there's so much of a smattering of everything that it, wouldn't you like to know a peanut butter jelly and sandwich is made of bread, peanut butter and jelly, and not just the result? 
So one thing I want to double click on that I find, I believe will be really valuable for the listeners is when we talk about the importance of open source technologies, it's obviously played an instrumental role in the evolution of the internet and where we are today. Having said that, with the emergence of the metaverse as the next frontier, there is now a conversation of, wait, so there's a metaverse and then there is this other thing, it's open metaverse. I would love if you can unpack in your mind in a way that the audience can really come out of this conversation with, okay, I finally understand actually what is an open metaverse. And so what is an open metaverse or even better, what would an open metaverse look like in the eyes of users, consumers, builders? So most people are familiar with what the internet is. Some people are familiar with what an intranet is. And an intranet is something that is a network built up usually within different companies or closed space or confined area that has all of the attributes of an internet, but is not open to the public per se. You know what I mean? When I worked at AWS, we have the AWS intranet. There are a ton of resources and amazing things in there. But if you're not inside of that network, you don't see any of it. You don't see this vibrant ecosystem that drives the business. So having a metaverse that is a closed off space that does not allow people to move in and out seamlessly is a metaverse, but it is not an open metaverse. Now on the internet, however, it is completely open. All of our networks are communicating and I can go from place to place, experience to experience, and maybe I have to log in, but in general, I can still access quite a bit of it openly and across that. So when we talk about an open metaverse, I think the equivalence is the open metaverse is what is more akin to an internet versus a metaverse, which would be more towards an intranet or a closed experience. And these will be essential, and there will be gateways that can get you from an open metaverse to a metaverse. But you'll find out that everything that we're talking about here, we got, we talk to metaverse, this is like a repeat of the 90s, man. It really is. We've done a lot of these things, and there are so many parallels that exist that for every scenario you come up with, we could probably point to the same thing in the 90s that we dealt with. So just for benchmarking, using your explanation, would Facebook and something like Horizon Worlds, assuming it's closed, and something like Facebook would be example of intranets? So that is... You're talking about experiences, though, okay? A metaverse is the collection of all the experiences. That's the difference between what you call the internet and a website. So if Facebook builds an entire experience with beautiful buildings and all this great stuff and all this information, that's not the metaverse. That's their experience on the metaverse. But let's use Roblox, for example. Let's sure. put Facebook aside. Let's look at Roblox. Yeah. Roblox, in a way, is a closed network of a lot of virtual worlds built by different developers sure. and creators, right? And it doesn't have interoperability across the experiences, but it's a network of virtual world built inside, an, at the moment, an isolated closed world right. platform. Would Do you think that Roblox is an example of essentially could have components that make it look like a closed guarded metaverse? Or do you think that no one platform can actually be referred to as a metaverse? I'll propose a counter question to you. Is Facebook the internet? Sure not. Why? It has a very large, deep, rich environment with many different ecosystems and worlds and groups and places and everything. It's the equivalent in 2D. Why is Facebook not the internet? Well, because I think there is... So if Facebook is the internet, what is everything else? <laughs> and then if Roblox, if, and if Roblox is the metaverse, then what is everything else? I, exactly. No, I agree with you, which I think leads me to basically saying what I think some proponents of a metaverse claim, which is there is no metaverses. There is one metaverse just like there is one internet. There cannot be multiple metaverses. If there are multiple metaverses, that there isn't a metaverse, essentially. Right. That's right. That's right. That's okay. exactly it. In other words, it, by the term itself, metaverse being all of them all encompassing, there can be multiple universes in a metaverse. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So there still has just to like be websites on Just like websites on the internet, right? You got it. That's exactly it. No matter how big of an experience you make, it is not the internet. And no matter how immersive and insanely fantastic of a metaverse you create, it is not the metaverse. It is an experience. 
just like yeah, a website I, is not the internet. And I think that's a, an important distinction for folks to keep in mind, which is the, the, there is an element of the emergence of a metaverse that is very much architecturally related, right? It's not something mm -hmm. that anyone can call themselves a metaverse. There needs to be those components that made the internet and not the internets. That's right. That's exactly it. That's the whole point of it. So if you look at it, there are a lot of parallels of what it is. And we're going to see pieces where we can share things from one experience to another. When I can take a skin that I get from a Fortnite concert that Marshmallow did and bring it into Roblox, when I can do that, the Roblox experience is a part of the metaverse, just like Fortnite's, Fortnite's concert is a part of the metaverse. But neither of them are the metaverse. But as I can traverse, the difference is that you become a part of the metaverse when I can begin sharing my identity, my character, my avatar, my experiences, things about me that are more decentralized that I can bring over to another one. You touched upon something also in re regards to standards. And I wanted to ask, how do you co collaborate or how do you perceive initiatives like the Metaverse Standards Forum that was established recently? Is that complementary to some of the work that <clears throat> the Linux Foundation is doing? Is that something that you believe is contributing to creation of shared standards and understandings between organization? I'm not really as familiar with all the work that they're doing in the Metaverse Standards Forum. I'm not a part of it. I do understand what it is and what it's looking to do. <clears throat> it's just, from my view, if we take a look at what happens in open source and standards, you'll find out that implementations and collaboration are really what drive it. It's not the intent to set up an idea to figure out how to do it. It's more of, hey, we've already arrived here, okay? Let's actually make this into something that's more of a standard because we have a, a defined need for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if we take a look in history, like what happened with OpenGL and what's happening with Vulkan, and it's been that, that part of where we had a starting basis, but it was smattered, but we had something. And so it became that. So the differentiating factor is that I know they want to build the standards of what they want to do, and they want to you know, kind of build the governance around it. But I think it doesn't start at that. I think it starts at the implementation and some of the elements around it and the community to help build the standard, not let's find out who can build a standard and how to do it. Understood. Great time to switch gears. Let's talk game engines. I personally believe that game engines are a key engine, no pun intended, in powering the future of the internet, especially next generation experiences and virtual worlds in 3D. What are the key advantages for developers building with AAA engine of O3D? What are some of the use cases and success stories that you're seeing that you can share with the listeners? So the interesting thing with, with what they're doing in AAA engines and even O3D is that they have an opportunity to build these specialized experiences. And mind you that some of these experiences, yes, they're game engines, but Having an engine that's actually modular, where if I'm trying to just build a simulation or I don't need parts of it that are unnecessary, you know, like if I don't need an animation system or if I don't need particular runtimes or things that are not conducive to what I'm trying to build, being able to separate that, those out and make them as lean as possible is really essential. But if you're wondering, like, how do these relate to what we're going to be doing in Metaverse, then look at what happens today, okay? When you look at it when you load a web page it's really interactive isn't it what you don't realize is that thing loaded probably 15 javascripts and small applications and libraries in the background to do all that interactivity and it's almost in every page that you pull so AAA engines 3d engines open source engines even specifically you're going to see that as these continue to get matured they're going to become more and more modular kind of like how we use open png open jpeg open mpeg we use a lot of these libraries Having these things that are more table stakes and are componentized can allow people to not have to download as much code and be able to start using things like WebAssembly and WebGPU and start getting these experiences that are very seamless. Because if you really expect people to be pulling down these giant clients for every metaverse experience, that's a whole different arena. I mean, think about it. When I'm moving from experience to experience, I would literally have to fire up two engines at the same time. I'm in a current experience. I'm moving to another experience, and I need both engines running with both network stacks talking in both directions so that I can traverse from one to another, if you think about it. 
So that means that open source, componentized assemblies, things that we do today that give us the rich experience that we have on the web, they're going to be essential as well. And the cost for a company to maintain all of the systems is really expensive. And so by having open source engines, working with others, even like with Unreal, right? Having the ability of using some of the modules of what are open source, and using the modules from Unreal, and being able to move assets between the two engines freely allows people to trim it down, make it easier to move from place to place. And this is all forward thinking of where we need to be thinking of where we need to arrive, what the destination needs to look like. So that a company like Epic that makes amazing stuff like Nanite, some of their great technologies, think they really care about a runtime loader, right? So you allow people to start using some of the components in an open source form that everybody is basically contributing to and building as a whole, but then allowing them to use their advanced technologies and their intellectual property to really prop up, yes, you should be using this and licensing this to get this kind of experience. One of the things that excites me about <clears throat> the frontier of the metaverse is the notion that we're going to build a whole, actually, not a whole new virtual economy, but a much greater, much bigger virtual economy, essentially extending and expanding what is happening on the internet now because of the paradigm shift of moving from a 2D world to a 3D world, mm -hmm. all of the associated things that we talked about. It will most likely impact different categories and different sector of creation and engagement and businesses. Part of that in my imagination includes the opportunity for a whole new generation of creators and jobs and people that are doing things that potentially you and I in this point of time cannot even imagine what they're going to create. And it seems to me that the role of open source technology in democratizing access to those tools of creation are, is going to play an instrumental role, not only in realizing something like the metaverse, but actually making sure that the opportunities and the prosperity associated with it is going to be available and accessible to a much, much greater population around the world. And I think that coexists really well with a lot of what we're seeing with the fear of AI and automation will steal all of our jobs. It may steal all of the jobs of today, right? but if we look 10, 20 <laughs> years down the line, there are going to be so many new jobs that we are just not thinking about because a 3D internet is not here yet. Would right. you, do you share that sort of worldview? I do. I definitely, the one thing that we've seen from generation to generation is always new technologies, new advancements, create new opportunities in different ways. I mean, come on. Rewind 30 years and say, yeah, I'm going to be sitting in front of my computer and have millions of people following me. Like, it's so absurd, it's not even funny. Today, it's like, yeah, get something cool out there, it goes viral, and guess what? You got a million people following you. So, yeah, that's definitely going to happen. And you touched on a very important piece, which is that content creators want to use the tools to create their content that they like best. And open source, and this was one of the things that really, when we started working with like, Unreal and having them join our foundation, in open source, that was a key element. And there, there won't just be one engine that rules them all for the open source and for, or for the metaverse space. It's healthy to have multiple engines. It's healthy for them to have choices. It's good for them to be able to use the tools they want. The key is to make sure that the tools at least are interoperable, allow people to use what they want, and then move to where they want to be in a, pref in a preferred way. That's a smart move for both open source and commercial. Instead of trying to, when people ask me, they're like, why? Why would that be the case? That's why, because it's actually smart business. It's kind of a future-proofing yourself in a means where we're going to see a lot more of this occur. And so you have content developers and content producers are going to have tools that never existed. You're going to have ways of producing new content. I mean, when we start talking about 3D and assets, I love when people are like, oh, yeah, I'll just take my Mario character and move him from one place to another. Do you know how many pieces are involved with Mario? Okay, I like to play a lot of different games, and so a lot of my friends have, like, different, they'll buy skins that they'll get for their characters, and I'm like, oh, you're dressing up your dolls, because I like to pick on them that way. But the reality is it's not so far-fetched, because all of those skins have a model, and then they have a jacket, and pants, and boots, and tattoos, and different accessories that go along with it. Each one of those things, somebody will be a fashion design creator in a virtual world. Somebody will be doing 
all of these things. And then when we talk about the decentralization, how will I take those with me? I want to wear my marshmallow shirt with my run DMC, and I want to walk into Roblox with that, or I want to walk into Call of Duty or whatever it is. Those creators that create that user-generated content for that intellectual property and have that happening on the chain, these are all new things that they don't really exist today. But you can bet they need to and will. And you're saying something interesting. I think there's two elements. One, first of all, we're already seeing that. We are seeing yeah, fashion, we are. a next generation of virtual fashion designers, right? Fashion right, designers right. are now, we employ some of them, we work some of them, particularly right. on the Roblox platform. And we're seeing this new generation <clears throat> emerging. And it's not far from the day where, of course, you will have... Exactly. And you'll see yeah. fashion brands who are building virtually as well. It's already happening as well. The other thing you said, which I think is really important, is that we definitely want to make sure that this new generation has the ability to create and thrive and build businesses. That's important for the economy. So it's not locked in one place yeah. and monetize their talent, which leads me to the next point I wanted to double click on, which is Web3 slash blockchain slash decentralized technologies mm -hmm. where I feel like we're in this mid of a clash, almost like a clash of civilization between proponents of a decentralized open metaverse versus a wall guarded metaverse and with blockchain technologies that are cross caught in the crossfire of the discussion. And so you hinted on that when you were just talking about decentralized platforms. There's a use case. So what's your point of view? How does the Linux Foundation think about blockchain and Web3 technologies? And what do you believe the role it plays in enabling an open metaverse? The key behind it is understanding where you're going to use it. Some people think, oh, well, it all needs to be, cent it all needs to be centralized. And then I think it needs to be all decentralized. But the reality is that neither of those are correct. It's that there are experiences that will have centralized assets that belong to that experience, that stay within that experience, that are not intended to go outside of it. And then there are decentralized assets which is when I want to carry Mario or carry different things that need to be tied in against my identity, which also should be decentralized because we don't want Facebook to own everybody's account and then everybody have to authenticate against Facebook to know who you are. We want to make sure that those things, the things that allow you to traverse experiences, move between experiences, whether they're your identity, your wallet, the assets that you've purchased, intellectual property, those are things that will need to be decentralized. And Web3, NFTs, these are great tools for getting this done. All right. They're not perfect. Don't get me wrong. OK, this is not like we're going to land on smart contracts and they're great. I'd have a friend of mine that would jump on me in two seconds about that. But it is something that we have to work on and it's a part of it, but it won't live everywhere. OK, because when we get inside of an experience, there are certain parts of it that are specific to that experience. How many points did you score inside that experience? What are the things that you've gotten in that experience that are not traveling outside of it? Those stay centralized. There's no point in trying to decentralize. And as a matter of fact, it's going to make a bigger mess trying to decentralize things that don't need to be. Do you really care how many points I made in basketball playing inside of Roblox when I'm over in Fortnite? Probably not. That information doesn't need to traverse. But if I got the marshmallow t-shirt, that should traverse. So you see the use case for centralized versus decentralized and using the right tool for the job is essential. And it's these kind of arguments, having the use case, having the verticals, having people focused in that discipline is the key element behind it. And then the other part of it is, how does FinTech tie into that too, right? That's a whole other area. What are banks thinking about this? How are they looking at using the mechanisms to allow them to do it? We know microtransactions are a key point. And it's funny because if you roll back 10 years, people are like, oh no, free to play? Come on, that's not really gonna be a big thing and we're not gonna, let's keep in a subscription. Free to play came out, started really pushing 2008, 2009. All of a sudden it was like, hey, we can make more than 15 bucks a month. We can make 40 to 50 bucks a month. Who's going to buy skins? Apparently, everybody will buy skins. The way I think we about it, the way I think about it, no, I'm, you're making great points. And I think the way I think about it, and, and again, I'm not a minimalist of blockchain and I'm not a maximalist. I do believe yeah. there are fundamental truth about it. And I think there is one element, which is about the user experience, which I think you talked mm -hmm. about. I purchased a certain skin for my avatar. I really love that skin. I want to carry that with my avatar across the metaverse, right? I don't that's want your identity. My, that's who that's you my, are. Exactly. That's my identity. And I want to carry my identity with me wherever I go. Then there is a whole different aspect of decentralization 
and an open metaverse, which is the ownership piece. And in the ownership piece, I think there's also two areas. There is the consumer, the user, and there is the creator of the asset. And, right. and I think there is a lot of, there's just so much confusion between the two. And my thinking is we just need to continue and think about things in a very specific way. When we talk about, yeah. oh, uh, creators in web two cannot monetize, they cannot monetize effectively enough. That is a hundred percent true. Right. So right. let's think about how do they monetize in a world where their assets that they create are interoperable. And when they own assets and they can trade them or do whatever they want. And then there is the user, but I find it very confusing at this point. And it's totally normal because we're at the beginning of a massive transformation, sure. both with the metaverse as a paradigm shift of engagement on the internet and with the centralized technology, with the notion of ownership and identity ownership that you can carry with you. But I think that's why it's so important to understand also some of the challenges. You were talking about the financialization of that. Yeah. Millions of millions of people don't even own, don't even own stocks in the stock market. Imagine the flat, how they deal with the fluctuation when an asset they created for their avatar is going up a hundred or a thousand percent. They're going to go yeah. ballistic. That's right. That's right. And that's the reason why you have to get all of these different groups involved. That's the reason if we look at why we have this event that we're putting on in, in Austin, why we're doing this thing for a metaverse track there. It's not that we're trying to, you know, kind of fluff people. We're getting the people who are in these areas. We're getting the people from the banks and from the hedge funds, from the cloud, from the net, from the edge. They're talking about what they see today, what have they done in the past, and what they think it could be in the future. Nobody has a silver bullet. And then the next day, putting everybody into a room and letting them argue it out. Okay, everybody has a voice and opinion, no matter how good or how bad it is, it's still how we actually have to build it. But you need a starting point from people who have lived that particular discipline to do it. So that's the only way that when you say, I don't know, that we can get a clue, just an inkling of an idea. I have a ton of these conversations with people every day from different walks and different disciplines and different places to collect all of it together. And I form my opinions and my thoughts based off of what I know in business, engineering, and what I'm fed from people. But now we need more people to be talking to more people. You can't just have singular figureheads. They can bring them together. But we need that collaborative argument. And to be honest, what you just described is exactly why a key part of why every podcast with every guest, I just start with, what do you think the metaverse is, right? Because mm -hmm. I think it's very important that we have a true collection of ideas and thoughts and descriptions of what the metaverse means for people versus there is two or three people that are basically dictating what the metaverse could yeah. be. I will say this though, I will say this though, I do believe that Mark Zuckerberg with his choice of rebranding Facebook to Meta has turned on the light in a massive way at a global scale on the metaverse and the emergence of this next frontier. And, and I think that was a very important inflection point. I believe looking backwards 10, 15, 20 years from now, the day they announce the change of the rebrand is going to be remembered as one of the most important in the emergence of the metaverse, not because Facebook became the metaverse and not yeah. because Facebook potentially even are going to be one of the key players in the emergence of the metaverse. Right. No one know. really knows if that's the case, but just making that choice when you're an $800 billion company, yeah. rebranding your company. To me, that was much, much greater symbolic move than any billions of dollars that Facebook is investing in the Reality Labs initiative. But now that happened, I think it's super important that there's more initiatives. And I do believe that the Linux Foundation, as an organization that have been a proponent of an open internet, a collaborative internet, is playing a key role, an instrumental role in engaging in this conversation, bringing stakeholders around the table, and really making sure that ultimately we can build a next generation of the internet that is open, that is prosperous and that yes. makes sense both for users, for people and for businesses and creators. That's actually the key area right there. It has to be prosperous. Okay. The move by Facebook of what they did, you think about it, they put a marker in the ground. That's there's an old saying, if you don't have a market, make a market. Okay. And so the reality is they put the stake in the ground and said, this is going to be real and we're putting something behind it. 
But going back to your point, it has to be prosperous. If we take a look and rewind 15 years, I think, the telcos, 10, 15 years, the telcos were trying to limit the bandwidth for certain websites and have control of that. Now, imagine if we go back even further and they had control of how things flowed across the Internet. Well, now it would be a series of platforms connected with everybody else not being able to openly share or grow or become what they could. So that's why open source and the Linux Foundation, from my view, is very important because we at least get to push back under no one's flag saying we want this to be as prosperous and open so that all of us can grow, so that we can make sure that we have this, what we have as an Internet today will exist because any time there's something put in place or somebody has an angle, you are limiting, you are preventing it from its full potential. You know, imagine that. Oh, well, I'm going to go see this video, but i got to pay for Comcast's fast lane bandwidth for me to see this YouTube video. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't go to YouTube then. That's dystopia <laughs> to you. <laughs> right. But that's my point, is that we have to make sure that that playing, that level playing field occurs, that allows incumbents and allows them, because it's healthy. Look, if your business can't reinvent yourself because there are incumbents who are chopping it, chomping at the bit, you need to be more creative. That's how you got into business. It's how you'll survive. It's how you'll grow. There are companies, IBM, Microsoft, AMD, Intel, they've been doing this forever and a day, reinventing themselves, finding ways to do it, okay? Look, I mean, it's a doggy dog world, okay? And where you can catch the eyes and where you can get the attention and where you can innovate, that's going to drive it. You just need to make sure that the playing field level so that everybody can play ball. And again, it's taking lessons from history, right? And yes. If you look at something like AOL tried to be the they internet did. and right. it failed miserably, it doesn't right. work. And so I think the message here is any one company that will try by definition to or deterministically to become the metaverse will most likely fail. And the reason is, in my mind, it's not because it's just not possible and it makes no sense. It's you're just losing on the opportunity to create yeah. something that is much, much bigger together which is always the lesson learned from the entirety of human endeavor. That's exactly it. Because if you walk up and you tell somebody, no, you have to do it this way, they're going to look at you funny. Okay? They're going to say, that's not going to work. I look, at the Roman, look at the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire failed because they tried to create yeah. their own <laughs> metaverse, essentially. <laughs> that's actually a great point. But that's exactly it. So when you give people the opportunity, we'll create the giants. Fully agree. Fully agree. I actually just took note of this Roman Empire story. I may even take a deeper <laughs> dig and trying to write something because I am fascinated because essentially that's what they try to do, you know, and I think the lesson learning and you're seeing Zuckerberg working about and, you know, you never know, like, is it real? Is it not? When, sure, you know, sure. we understand we have to build an open metaverse and we want to be more like an Android. But right. I also find it a bit interesting and suspicious that is talking about building kind of an open Android ecosystem like for the metaverse, because the reality is in my mind, and this is maybe a provocative, but <laughs> I believe one of the reasons that he's promoting this Android type of thing is because he knows that he probably can compete with Apple on the closed ecosystem mm -hmm. model because they just do it too well. They're doing it for a long time. They essentially, in my mind, almost monopolized consumer technology access with their beautifully designed devices, incredibly well integrated architecture, semiconductor technology, artificial intelligence, all of those things that they've been building for the past 20, 25 years. And he, he probably understands that the only possible way you can do it is Android approach, but that's also not the DNA of Facebook. And a thing or two about open source, and you've also worked at a large enterprise like Amazon. Yeah. So from a DNA perspective, how challenging it's going to be for someone like Meta to suddenly become more of, a, of an open source or an open ecosystem enabler. The key here is, and it's funny if you think about an Amazon, the same perspective, is that to lean in on your strengths. Don't try to be something that you're not. Don't try to drive something that you're not, okay? Facebook has some amazing technologies on how they're able to track what people are doing and to get their attention and how to actually be able to share and, and communicate. They're amazing at that. So they should lean into those heavily on what they're doing because those are essential components of the social when it comes to the metaverse. 
And they don't have to master the metaverse to do it. They can master the social element within the metaverse and do amazingly well. So that would be my suggestion. Now, the other part of it is that contributing into all the other areas of the metaverse, you don't have to take them over. But if you're contributing, that means you have the most knowledge on how to actually lean forward with your best foot because you'll know the ways of getting it done. You know what I mean? It's one of those things when you look at it from the perspective that I know how to do my job, but if I drop you into a new ecosystem, how do I do my job? How do I connect all that? So that's a good reason of why somebody like Meta, or any company as a matter of fact, should be involved in the metaverse, contributing to it, because it helps them shape every year's worth of vision. It helps them shape their five-year and their 10-year vision of where things are. If you don't know what's going on, you can't be effective in what you're trying to do. Or as Yogi Berra said once, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up someplace else. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking more of the old thing, like out of the room, out of the deal, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. So, Royal, before we conclude this terrific conversation, also one last thing I like to ask every guest is, what's the one thing you want our listeners to take away from the conversation today? The one thing I would say is listen to everything that's going on. Understand as much as you can. Talk, communicate, share, get involved with different open source projects. Find that passion, that, that love, that drive that you have, that you would do even if you weren't getting paid, and contribute into it. This is going to take a lot of work from all of us having those conversations. And if you're not sure, seek out some of the people like myself and others that are talking about it. You know, it's, we're not untouchable. We actually are easy to get a hold of and ask because for every question that you ask us, that is more information that we can figure out how to direct more people and how to get more things and create more events and how to drive this forward. So it's not just one person's view, it's everybody's. And other than things like that, if there are events where you can share face-to-face, -face, be a part of them. Just because you can type behind the screen is great, but when you're face-to-face -face and you have that surfing conversation, kind of like what we're doing today in this podcast, uh, you would find out that the most amazing, innovative things will occur, and you'll find out that your strokes of brilliance are what will form what we do tomorrow. Royal, I love it. Thank you so much, and I'm grateful for you taking the time joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. Absolutely. And then I guess one last thing I'd like to bring up is that we do have this Metaverse event that we're doing. It's in Austin, Texas from October 17th to the 19th. We're hosting it. Even though I run the Open 3D Foundation, we have an event there. This is the first time as a Linux Foundation that we're doing something for the Metaverse in each one of these different tracks that are not necessarily 3D graphics are, and related are there as one of the tracks, but we're going to be talking about blockchain identity, authentication, edge, cloud, scaling servers. What does a metaverse server tomorrow got to look like? Um, how is it tied to fintech? How are we handling intellectual property? So a lot of these things are going to be people from the different Linux Foundation and different companies that are going to be talking about it. So I would say if you happen to be in Austin or you want to learn more about it, you can look up O3DCon Metaverse. You can find it on the Internet and uh, take a look. And I uh, would love to have more conversations with more people. Thank you so much for inviting everyone, Royal. And thank you for being with me today. It was awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Into the Metaverse. We hope you learned a lot and explored new aspects of the Metaverse.